we got to talk about here is you will see patients uh, that have rotator cuff problems in your practice. And by far, most people who have rotator cuff tears will never need surgery, okay? So if you're, well, I don't want you like so young, it doesn't even matter. But if you're 60 years old, I'm close to 60. I have a 50% chance of having a rotator cuff tear at the age of 60. We don't operate on every 60 year old. So people who have rotator cuff tears, they always come in and they're like, I was a mason, you know, I was a bricklayer, I was a hairstylist, I was doing hair. I, everyone always wants to think of a reason why they have a rotator cuff tear, but the majority of them are just degenerative. They just happen. So people get rotator cuff tears. But the patients always will go, well, when I was in college, I was playing football and I hurt the, they didn't tear the rotator cuff when they're in college. You don't live like 40 years with a rotator cuff tear. In college, people don't usually tear the rotator cuff. So it's very unusual to see someone in their 20s with a rotator cuff tear. I don't think he's been with me now close to five months. We haven't seen one 20 year old with a rotator cuff tear. They don't get it. They may get rotator cuff tendonitis. They may have a rotator cuff partial tear, which is a bad term, Neil, because when patients read their report, they go, Dr. Mile, I have a rotator cuff tear, and it says partial tear of the rotator cuff. And what is a partial tear of the rotator cuff? In your opinion, as a radiologist? A partial tear of the rotator cuff. It's a small little tear. It's tendinopathy. Yeah. It's, it's almost like it's scuffed. If I took something and rubbed this tablecloth and it was all rough, but that's what a partial tear is. Or if it's on the underside, it gets beat up a little bit, but it just means the actual thickness of the cuff is less. Not that it's like my skin. I hate to say it, but like I used to have nicer skin, but you know, your skin gets thinner as we get older. We all hate it. You guys don't have to worry about it yet, but yeah. you know, that's, it's, it's thinner. And the rotator cuff can get thinner and that can be a partial tear when you see thinning of the cuff. So that's a bad term because patients just read cuff tear. All they see in the report they, and they'll come in, I got six tears in my cuff, doc. And I'm like, all right, six tears in your cuff. And they're reading the report or labral tears. So what percentage of the population at age 40 has a labral tear, uh, if you had to say, Neil? 50%. 50%. That's just part of the natural aging process. But patients get their MRIs back and they go, oh my God, I got a labral tear. Or if they get in a car accident, God forbid, then someone's responsible you know, for that labral tear. It's not right. So... Uh, you know, and, I, and it's, 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 that's, that's a tough on me because he knows right now my daughter pulled out in front of another car in rural Virginia and she stopped and they hit her bumper, but now there's injuries. You know, everyone, uh, like a 20 mile an hour collision is injuries. Yeah. Anyhow, so I want to start with that because most people don't need to have surgery for rotator cuff problems. So then the question is who does? So there is one variant that usually is more likely to get it. So if I fall, God forbid, again, like I did with my Achilles, going out of this restaurant, land on my arm, and I tear my rotator cuff, an acute traumatic tear, which is one out of six, those are patients that benefit from rotator cuff repair more than others because they did not have a problem. They had a fall. And if so anyone knows what I wanted to show you is that what kind of goes into if you do have surgery. So we, we, we know that if you... If you don't have an acute traumatic tear and you have a, a patient that's over the age of 65, you always should send them to physical therapy first. You know, they're going to benefit from some physical therapy. And if you do injections, you can inject them. But those patients will probably benefit from one round of physical therapy. They always want to get an MRI. I know they probably come to you guys and go, I need an MRI because they see that on TV. And that's okay to get an MRI. But just remember, when they get that MRI, the MRI for me right now says partial thickness, rotator cuff tear, labral tear, biceps, tendonitis, and tendinopathy because I've had an MRI. My shoulder doesn't hurt right now, but I've had it injected before. So just make sure you, I usually explain to them, I say, look, I'm going to get an MRI, but you're 65, we're probably going to see a partial thickness tear and some tendinopathy. So when they come back, they go, oh, hey, doc, exactly like you said, I had, I had this. And you can treat them therapy and injection, anti-inflammatories, all that is just fine. There's no urgency in treating degenerative rotator cuff tears, meaning that if you fall outside the door, that's urgency. But if it's, I was working out at the gym and my shoulder hurt, or I was, you know, kind of doing some gardening and my shoulder hurt, well, there's not an urgency to really getting, you know, an MRI or surgery. So now let's go flashback to patients who do need to have surgery, and I'll see if this kind of can advance a little bit. So this is actually how clean, and this is what it really looks like. If you have everything working well, this right here is the bone. This is what a rotator cuff tendon looks like. You don't tear the muscle, you tear the tendon. So this tendon should be on this lunar landscape. It should be attached there, but it's not. So I just have a little grasper where I'm gonna pull the tendon back. But if you get an acute tear, usually it's really easy to bring it back. 
So if I go in and someone had a tear for a year, it can be scarred and it can be hard. But if I go in with this, what we call, you know, a kingfisher or a bird beak grasper and grab it and pull it, and it comes right over, I know that was a relatively acute event. So what I want to do to look at these is I have to do surgery. So everybody always like wants to know what is it like to have surgery? And let me tell you something, like people are not surgery adverse in the United States. I mean, we do, people go to us to have surgery for all kinds of things. You, you know that. There's cosmetic surgeries, there's different surgeries, there's dental surgeries, but I think it's still surgery. And so one of the things that we worry about is that, okay, this is how you have this, this is what I see when I do a surgery, but I have everybody now going to get uh, like benzoyl peroxide wash because we have a dermatologist in the back. But what do men have? Men are dirty. I, my, my daughter loves when I say this. We have, we have P. acnes or QT bacterium acnes, but 10 times the amount of bacteria on the skin of a male is a female. So if you swab a man's skin, it's much greater. So I have most of my patients go get this wash the night before surgery to decrease the load of bacteria, and then we also prep it out, obviously, before surgery, and we give antibiotics IV in everybody. So everybody gets IV antibiotics. 20 minutes we like before surgery, but within an hour, we generally want it into the system. So that's really important when you're doing surgeries. The other thing is that what you guys help me with is that what's a good surgical candidate? Well, you know, you don't have diabetes. I'm making that assumption, but I'm gonna say you don't have diabetes. You're not a smoker. That's a good surgical candidate. You know, this lady enjoys smoking cigars and, uh, you know, she uh, stays out late. But, I mean, the point being is that you, you have to look at the patients you're selecting. So rotator cuff healing is predicated upon not being a diabetic, not having immunocompromised, not taking steroids, not smoking. So if I have a patient who has all these problems, sometimes I steer them towards non-operative management because the chance of the tendon healing goes down. So we know that the tendon healing is best in younger patients. So an 85-year-old has a rotator cuff tear. Yes, you can do surgery, but the chance of that tendon healing diminishes dramatically. So that's a patient better off with non-surgical management. And if I do this procedure, the minute you fix a rotator cuff, you've just taken away six months of somebody's life. So when I'm 80 years old, I might not have that much more time, right? I don't want to lose six months. Maybe I want a shot and go back to the golf course or go play tennis or travel. So you have to think about the people don't think about their recovery that well. You know, they're like, oh, I'm going to go get this fixed. But even for me in this, this is basically two months of being in a boot. And luckily, Earl's here for another six weeks. But no, but I, I, mean, I, I mean, it is hard. So when you think about this, sometimes you go, yeah, yeah, I got to get this fixed. But you don't think about the aftercare that goes into it or the amount of time that you're going to put into something. So I like to use this portal. So what we're, the, the thing that's gotten better, and that's what I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy who likes like kind of clever things, like you know, whether it's new, new apps or new phones or new computers or robotic assistants. But basically, we have these fiber optics that I can look at. When I take a picture of the suture, it looks as large as a rope. I mean, the fiber optic cameras we have today are just unbelievable. And the water pumps we have and the shavers and the devices we have to do surgery is really fantastic. But, I'm sorry. When, when we're looking at these, it's like puzzling. So I don't know if anyone like puzzles here, but you gotta kind of go in the shoulder, and once you get the burst out of the way and you're looking at the tendon, you, you kind of have to determine, there's like three different types. So this is the most common type that I see is more of a crescent type tear. With this, usually you can just bring it back and it's easy. Like this is a nice one. It's like right on the edge, it lays down nice, you know where you have to fix it. But what you're trying to do is get, to get a tendon to heal, you need the bone to bleed. You need the tendon to basically scar to the bone. It's not like you grow the tendon back into the bone. We have a dermatologist, we've disturbed Sharpie's fibers. I don't even know what you call that fibrous tissue that now, but it's not really tendon, is it? So what, what comes back when it heals isn't really the same as the tendon you had when you were born. But for that to occur requires strict immobilization, really good compression of the tendon against the bone. And the reason for that is in our joint, in the shoulder joint has fluid, and the fluid will degrade any scar. So your shoulder fluid keeps the joint limber, but it's a disaster for what I'm trying to do. Because if you have motion and the fluid gets between there, the lysozymes and the other enzymes will degrade my little clot, and now my tendon doesn't heal. So I want that compression. So that's very, very important for healing. So nutrition becomes really important too. 
So, you know, I, you can't say enough about nutrition, but if people don't eat healthy and don't get enough protein and, and the rest of the minerals in their diet, they're not gonna heal. This is when it gets really fun. So this is a tear pattern called a U-shaped tear, but we fix it almost like you're fixing a football. So you have this big U and what you do is you minimize the amount of surface area by passing these sutures. Once you tie all these, now you've made a crescent suture. So the whole idea is to kind of get back to the crescent suture again and, and repair that. And so you can do that. That's a U-shaped tear. And finally, this is the trickiest one because it's hard to find the tip. So this makes it look, look real nice in a cartoon, but usually there's part of the tendon goes posterior or back and you've got to grab it and pull it back. So we have all these amazing little instruments that look like alligator graspers that can grab that tissue and pull it back. And what we're trying to do is sew the tendon back to the bone. And before I do this, I take a burr and I burr down the bone so I make it bleed. So once we've done that, we get, we're gonna mobilize the tendon. But this is actually what surgery looks like. It's not like doing open surgery where you think there's lots of bleeding and other things. What you're doing with these little probes that are heat probes is you remove all the scar tissue. So one of the goals is whenever you have an injury, you get a lot of scar tissue. If you can remove all that scar tissue, you can mobilize the tissue to bring it back. And then you're gonna release and remove. So this is actually what a ball looks like. That's a humeral ball. And this is a really nice one. So this articular cartilage is pristine. So what, and here's something also to take to the bank. You can see the, the socket also looks good. If you have arthritis in your shoulders, so let's say you in your practice have a patient with arthritis, we would never fix the rotator cuff in a patient who has arthritis. So once you get arthritis, that's like having a queen and an ace in blackjack. You know, that supersedes any rotator cuff problem. So as soon as we see arthritis, or if you see it on the x-ray or the report from Dr. Prakash says mild to moderate glenohumeral arthritis, I would never fix a rotator cuff in that patient. That patient is gonna need a shoulder replacement someday if they need an operation. And they don't have to have a shoulder replacement. I mean, you can try some of the homeopathic things. I mean, I mean it's funny because my best friend's uh, uh, homeopathic doctor and both of his sisters are. So they use stuff like Arnica and turmeric and all these different things, but that's not bad. You know, if you can get someone to take that to hydrate and do exercises, it, you can avoid you know, some of the problems with arthritis or at least put off having a joint replacement for a while longer. Because once you replace your joint, you've just started the clock because that joint will fail. It will predictably fail in all human beings. So I like not to do a joint replacement until you've reached that kind of point where the patient can't sleep, they're miserable, their bad days outnumber their good days, but you would never fix a rotator cuff tear in a patient with arthritis. And I get a lot of patients that come in who have their MRI report and they read rotator cuff tear, but they don't see the part that said severe arthritis. So I thought this is actually what it really looks like. And I thought this was a really cool picture because sometimes I can actually cut between the tissue and I can pull this tissue back down. But if you do this, the more kind of difficult the operation, the more likely it's not gonna heal, right? The simple tears heal 90% of the time. So if you have a small, simple tear, it'll heal very well. The bigger the tear, it can be very difficult to slide this where I'm showing an interval slide. But this is actually, you know, when we have these cameras, the resolution is unbelievable. And this is just kind of in, we're identifying the tear pattern. We have these tools that grab it. We can pass the sutures with this. So once I grab the tissue in the inside, I can put stitches into the shoulder. So you can see from the fiber optic camera, the shoulder glows. So it has this kind of look to it. So we can kind of, you know, do this operation in a very timely fashion. But I think the thing that is most important isn't doing the operation. I, I mean, we saw probably 10 people that had the surgery day, and to this point, I've done 2,000 rotator cuff repairs. But more important than the actual surgery is patient compliance, because when I give you an immobilizer and send you home, I don't know what happens, you know, if I tell you not to use your arm, because people will try to do more. And so you really have to impress upon people that if you don't hold this still and you start moving this too soon, you know, these sutures that we use will actually come apart and then the tendon won't heal. And so probably the biggest uh, disasters for me are people falling after surgery, because just like I have this boot on, if your arm's in a sling, your balance isn't as good. So when you're trying to walk around, I always get, so I've had one guy fall in his pool because he was trying to clean his pool with his immobilizer on. I had a guy fall off a floating dock. I've had someone slip 
at the DMV because they wanted their handicap permit, so they fell again at the DMV. So, you know, or, or they take too much pain medicine. So I think that's a real problem. But we've kind of, the new law was good. I mean, at least in my practice, because I don't give hardly any Percocet. I, I've written one Percocet script in the past two months. You know, I don't give that out anymore. And uh, I mean, I don't know about you guys in your f family practice or internal medicine practices. If you went back five years, whether you're giving out more pain medicine, but even for fractures, we try not to do it. You know, we'll give out tramadol or anti-inflammatories. And, uh, you know, it became a big problem. It was a big problem in my practice because then the patients come back just to get pain medicine. Or the mother that, well, sorry, I'm sorry to pick on mothers, but the mother that goes, yeah, my son's still hurting. He needs some more Percocet, you know. And I'm like looking at the kid like he's not hurting, you know, but the mom's like sitting there. And so you guys are probably better psychiatrists than I am, but I can figure that one out. You know, I can figure that out. So I don't know. Um, so I don't know if you guys had any questions about rotator cuff tears that I could answer, perhaps. And certainly if you have questions during the, the dinner, you can come and we can talk a little bit. But this was more just a way of, of us saying thank you. Uh, you know, and uh, just for me to get to know when I see your name, I, I can put a face to a name and I can I know where the patient's going. And uh, also, just like I was telling Dr. No, I've gotten my uh, my painter and my um, uh, air conditioner repairman as a patient. When I get hurt now, I got to find a doctor. So I got to know who's out there. So but, uh, Dr. Prakash reads a lot of my MRIs and does a lot of favors for me because one of the things about I've been the team doctor at Plant High School for about what, maybe 12 years now, 10 to 12. But the tower radiology has graciously given us up to 10 MRIs for free every year uh, because interestingly, everyone thinks plants like such a wealthy school, but most of my football players, a lot of them are either on Medicaid or have no insurance, you know, and, or, or they're, it's $5,000 to get an MRI or something. I mean, these, these high deductible plans and you know, a kid who's from a working mom can't afford that. So they've been great. And then they'll read the MRIs and coach Wiener wants the report by, he thinks we're a professional football team. So the injury happens on Friday night. He's like, doc, Hey, what did the MRI say? Like he's asking me Saturday morning. So he's been really good about uh, helping me out with stuff like that. But I mean, we have like with our group, just not shoulder, but we do all facets of orthopedics. So, I mean, and that's what I think is kind of unique is we've kind of sequestered out different areas of expertise. So if it's hip or knee or spine or, or foot and ankle, we have different providers that do each of that. So that's been really good. And it's been, uh, I've been here now, this is going uh, on about 18 years. So you were saying we're, we're, we're about the same in the game. So it's, uh, it's been good. It's been a great place to, to practice. So thank you guys very much.